But the federal government is looking to reduce the number of temporary residents in Canada. Polls show that there are a growing number of uh, concerns over some of that, uh, the number of newcomers in this country and the lack of a housing and affordability. There are also concerns that it could lead to a labor shortage. I spoke with the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship on Friday about that. Minister Miller, thanks for making the time. Thanks for having me on, as always, Rosemary. You're hoping to reduce the number of temporary residents in Canada by almost 20 percent uh, in three years. What categories will you target in particular in that group? It's an, you know, that's a really important question, Rosemary. Temporary people are here temporarily are form about 6.2 percent of the current population. That's something that has jumped in the last few years. Uh, it is people that have fled Russian aggression in Ukraine, so 300,000 Ukrainians. It's people on postgraduate work permits. It's international students. It's people that are working in post-production film in, in downtown Montreal, as well as uh, temporary foreign workers in the agricultural or, or seafood transformation sector. So it's a wide segment of people that are here that make our economy what it is. Um, and it is something that we need to get a grip on. It has grown to a level that is higher than it has ever been. Okay. Uh, and we need to take steps as the federal government to reduce that. Uh, we are signaling 20 percent. But we can't do it alone. It's something that provinces know their labor forces. Uh, we need to get together with them and make sure that we are working together so that we are not causing uh, damage to the economy while getting this important part of the population that is growing uh, under control. Why? Yeah. Uh, we know from the studies that economists have produced that that impacts the cost of shelter uh, and making sure that we are signaling to the market, signaling to economists, signaling to, to Canadians that this is something that we need to do responsibly, I think is very important. So part of the announcement that I made yesterday was to make sure that temporary people that are here temporarily form part of our levels plan that I'm statutorily obligated to report mm -hmm. to Parliament on every year, which is an important change to what we've been doing normally, which is just report on on, on people that are our levels for permanent residency. So uh, a couple big changes, but they are ones that will need to be done in partnership with provinces who, who do have that responsibility to, uh, to tell us what they need, tell us what their needs are for the economy and be responsible for the people that are, um, that are, that are in Canada as well as we are. You, you, you said at the press conference when you made this announcement that Canada, like other countries, has become addicted to temporary foreign workers. What, why, why do you say that and how do you uh, mitigate for that? Because, as you know, one of the problems with temporary foreign workers is that Canadians don't want to do that work. Um, and, and so people will have to reach out to temporary foreign workers in order to make sure there's enough in the labor force. Well, one, that's true, and I wouldn't exaggerate that, that, that portrayal. There are certain sectors of the economy and the agricultural sector in particular yeah. Uh, and the areas that my colleague Randy Boissonneau administers in, in, in labor market impact assessments that allow for that sort of lower wage aspect of, of work in the economy, very important, uh, particularly in an environment of food inflation to make sure we have those workers here. Uh, but that isn't the entirety of the picture. It's students on work permits. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's people that are seeking asylum here in Canada. Uh, and it's very highly specialized people that are here that we can't train in here in Canada or don't have sufficient skills to train. So it's a broader bucket than that, but certainly it is something, yes, we have become addicted to. The numbers betray that. And it's something I think we know and acknowledge has had an impact on affordability and, and notably the cost of shelter. And it's something I think we owe it to ourselves and owe it to Canadians uh, to take a second look at as, uh, as the labour market constricts a bit. You, you said you have to sit down and, and discuss the targets with the provinces. How, how flexible are you uh, to, to any concerns they might have? Because, as you said, this is a, a wide variety of people uh, that fall under this uh, rubric, and, and some provinces might have different needs than others. You know, I, th I would say very flexible, willing to look at a, 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 a blank slate to see where the labor needs are. There's two aspects to this, Rosemary, the influx, the people that come in here, but also the output or the transition into permanent residency. We've given a number of responsibilities to provinces to transition or to have provincial nominee programs to transition the people that they choose and select to be part of, uh, be part of the economy or be, be or, or, or to be Canadians, permanent mm -hmm. residents. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, asking, we're asking provinces to take a little more responsibility with the labor force that exists in their provinces in order to perhaps offer some transition to permanent residency with uh, the nominee programs that they have and are quite proud of and, and frankly advocate for more of. 
And so this will be a discussion with us in terms of the federal programs that we administer, and there's a there's there's a bucket load of them, and the provincial programs that are administered by provinces in order to make sure that there is also an outflow of temporary residents to the permanent residence path and ultimately Canadian citizenship. So we aren't just bringing people in and, and stranding them here with no hope of becoming permanent residency. So that's another aspect of this that needs to be discussed um, in private, but also uh, discussed with, uh, with Canadians. I, I, I want to have you ask you a couple questions about uh, the ongoing situation in, in Gaza. Uh, the program to, in place that you put in place to try and get Canadians' extended family out of Gaza has not, has not worked. I think you would agree with that assessment. 14, 14 people, I think, have managed to get out of the region. You yourself called the program a failure. Where, where does the failure lie? I, I, like, what, what are you saying to, is it, is it Israel? Is it Egypt? Where, where is the problem that you cannot seem to unblock this? Well, Rosemary, for all our efforts, we do not control the Rafa gates, which is the main point of egress for people fleeing humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Uh, it is administered by Kogat and Egyptian authorities, so the Israeli Minister of Defense uh, and, and, and Egypt. Uh, there's some coordination that goes on when we try to get people out. We certainly had to do so in getting Canadian permanent residents, Canadians and permanent residents out. And we have not had the success of, uh, uh, of convincing those authorities that these programs were one, ones where we could successfully get the hundreds of names out that we've put forward to them after, done, after having done our initial triage for people that will then have to get into uh, the Cairo to do additional biometrics and then come to Canada. The but, 14, but why have you not been able to convince them? Like, what, what is the problem when you say, these are people who have relatives in Canada, we want them to get out, we are the Canadian government, why can't you allow this? Like, where is the block, I guess? Well, certainly I'm not going to speak for them and I'm not going to speak too much publicly about the diplomatic efforts that are ongoing, specifically out of concern for the people that we are trying to extract from, uh, from Gaza. Uh, but clearly there are differences of views of the as to whether those people are entitled to eventually come to Canada. They are not Canadian. They are not Canadian permanent residents. Uh, and so that is uh, the discussion that is ongoing. There has been a concern, obviously, with all countries in getting their own residents out, getting permanent residents out, getting aid workers out. And then those uh, that are getting out are getting out through their own means, uh, often through 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 smuggling, uh, with people taking thousands of dollars per head for people to get out. And this is unconscionable. Um, this was a program that was set up. It is unique compared to other countries uh, quite quickly in, in December. It's one where we have a number of people that have gotten a step forward 900 people have applications and we have several hundred numbers of people on a list waiting to get out but we have had no success up to now which is why i've characterized it the way i have um, it doesn't prevent us from trying and continuing to try and continuing our advocacy so i do frankly out of concern for those that we're trying to get out hesitate to speak more about this publicly but it won't deter us from continuing our efforts because this is really a humanitarian effort that um that, that canada can't turn its eyes to you, you, you did seem to suggest this week that that the end the amended NDP motion that was passed is impacting uh, the work that that you and others might be doing in terms terms of trying to get people out because Israel didn't like that motion it, they were very upset with it um, is that what you meant that that it, when Israel sees things like that happen inside Parliament that they are that there is some sort of retaliation. Well, I, I do want to be clear in saying I did support the motion as amended. Yes. I think it is uh, as amended a principled motion that states the position of the government of Canada. Otherwise, we wouldn't have supported it. Sure. Uh, but it, not naive enough to think that words don't have consequences. And uh, Israel has been quite vocal about the, the potential consequences. And that can have uh, a repercussion at the negotiation table. And I won't say anything more about that. But again, um, it's nice to stand up in the House of Commons and... and uh, and do all these motions as well willing as they are but we also have to realize that we're in your negotiation rooms when we're trying to save lives uh, our words do have consequences and we can't be naive to that okay minister miller we'll leave it there thank you sir thank you